Act I of Trinomus, the Three Pieces of Money, by Titus Maccius Plautus. Translated by Henry Thomas Riley, 1816, 1878. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae In the Prologue Luxury, read by Sonia Poverty, read by Abai In the Play Charmides, an Athenian merchant, read by Todd Lesbonicus, the son of Charmides, read by Remy Callicles, a friend of Charmides, read by Mike Manalakis. Megaronides, a friend of Callicles, read by David Purdy. Stasimus, the servant of Charmides and Lesbonicus, read by Adrian Stevens. Philto, a wealthy Athenian, read by Algie Pug. Lysiteles, the son of Philto and a friend of Lesbonicus, read by Vocal Penguin. A Sharper, read by Alan Matstone. Stage Directions, read by Wayne Cook. Scene, a street in Athens, the house of Carmides on the one side and that of Philto on the other. Trinumus, the Three Pieces of Money. The Prologue, Enter Luxury and Poverty. Follow me this way, daughter that you may perform your office i am following but i know not what to say will be the end of our journey tis here see this is the house now go you in exit poverty who enters the house of carmides luxury to the audience now that no one of you may be mistaken in a few words i will conduct you into the right path if indeed you promise to listen to me first then i will now tell you who i am and who she is who has gone in here pointing to the house if you give your attention in the first place plautus has given me the name of luxury and then he has willed that this poverty should be my daughter but why at my suggestion she has just entered here Listen and give attentive ear while I inform you. There is a certain young man who is living in this house. By my assistance, he has squandered away his paternal estate. Since I see that there is nothing left for him to support me, I have given him my daughter, together with whom to pass his life. But expect nothing about the plot of this play. The old man who will come hither will disclose the matter to you. The name of this play in the Greek is The Treasure, Thesaurus. Philemon wrote it. Plautus translated it into Latin and gave it the name of The Three Pieces of Money, Trinumus. Now he begs this of you, that it may be allowed the play to keep that name. Thus much have I to say. Farewell. Attend in silence. Exit. Act the First, Scene One, Enter Megronides. To reprove one's friend for a fault that deserves it is a thankless task, but sometimes tis useful and tis profitable. Therefore this day will I soundly reprove my friend for a fault that much deserves it. Unwilling am I, did not my friendship bid me do it, for this faultiness has encroached too much upon good morals so drooping now are nearly all of them. But while they are in this distempered state, bad morals, in the meantime, have sprung up most plenteously, like well-watered plants. Nor is there now anything abundant here but these same bad morals. Of them you may now reap a most plenteous harvest. And here a set of men are making the favor of a few of much more value than that in which they may benefit the many. Thus private interests outdo that which is to the public advantage, interests which, in many points, are a hindrance and a nuisance, and cause an obstruction both to private and to public welfare. 
Scene two. Enter Calicles. Calicles, as he enters. I wish our household god to be graced with a chaplet. Wife, addressing her within, pay him due respect that this dwelling may turn out for us prosperous, lucky, happy, and fortunate. And that as soon as I possibly may, I may see you dead and gone. This is he who, in his old age, has become a child, who has been guilty of a fault that deserves correction. I will accost the man. Calicles, looking around. Whose voice is it that sounds near me? Of one who wishes you well, if you are as I desire you to be. But, if you are otherwise, of one who is your enemy and is angry with you. Health to you, O oh my friend and years, mate. How are you, Megaronides? And of faith, health to you, Callicles. Are you well? Have you been well? I am well, and I have been still better. And how does your wife do? How is she? Better than I wish. Tis well, a faith, for you that she is alive and well. Troth, I believe that you are glad if I have any misfortune. That which I have, I wish for all my friends as well. Harky, how does your wife do? She is immortal. She lives and is likely to live. Faith, you tell me good news, and I pray the gods that surviving you, she may last out your life. By my troth, if indeed she were only married to yourself, I could wish it sincerely. Do you wish that we should exchange? That I should take yours and you mine? I'd be making you not to get a bit the better of the bargain of me. Indeed, I fancy you would not be surprising me unawares. I, faith, I should cause you not to be knowing the thing you were about. Keep what you've got. The evil that we know is the best. But if I were now to take one that I know not, I should not know what to do. In good sooth, just as one lives a long life, one lives a happy life. But give your attention to this, and have done with your joking. For I am come hither to you for a given purpose. Why have you come? That I may rebuke you soundly with many harsh words. Me, do you say? Is there anyone else here besides you and me? Calicles, looking about. There is no one. Why, then, do you ask if tis you I mean to rebuke? Unless, indeed, you think that I am about to reprove my own self. For, if your former principles now flag in you, or if the manners of the age are working a change in your disposition, and if you preserve not those of the olden time, but are catching up these new ones, you will strike all your friends with a malady so direful that they will turn sick at seeing and hearing you. How comes it into your mind to utter these expressions? Because it becomes all good men and all good women to have a care to keep suspicion and guilt away from themselves. Both cannot be done. Why so? Do you ask? I am the keeper of my own heart, so as not to admit guilt there. Suspicion is centered in the heart of another. For if now I should suspect that you had stolen the crown from the head of Jupiter in the capital, the statue which stands on the highest summit of the temple, if you had not done so, and still it should please me to suspect you, how could you prevent me from suspecting you? But I am anxious to know what this matter is. Have you any friend or intimate acquaintance whose judgment is correct? Troth, I'll tell you without reserve. There are some whom I know to be friends. There are some whom I suspect to be so, but whose dispositions and feelings I am unable to discover, whether they incline to the side of a friend or an enemy. But of my assured friends, you are the most assured. If you know that I have done anything unwittingly or wrongfully, and if you do not accuse me of it, then you yourself will be to blame. I know it. And if I had come hither to you for any other purpose, you request what is right. If you have anything to say, I am waiting for it. Then, first of all, you are badly spoken of in general conversation by the public. Your fellow citizens are calling you greedy of groveling gain. And then, again, there are others who nickname you a vulture, and say that you care but little whether you devour enemies or fellow citizens. Since I have heard these things said against you, I have, to my misery, been sadly agitated. 
It is, and it is not, in my power, Megaronides. As to their saying this, that is not in my power. As to their saying this deservedly, that is in my power. Was this Carmides a friend of yours? He points to the house of Carmides. He both is, and he was. Uh, that you may believe it to be so, I will tell you a circumstance as a proof. For after this son of his had squandered away his fortune, and he saw himself being reduced to poverty, and that his daughter, who was grown up a young woman, and that she, who was both her mother and his own wife, was dead, as he himself was about to go hence to Seleucia, he committed to my charge the maiden his daughter, and all his property, and that profligate son, these, I think, he would not have entrusted to me if he had been unfriendly to me. What say you as to the young man, who you see to be thus profligate, and who has been entrusted to your care and confidence? Why do you not reform him? Why do you not train him to frugal habits? It would have been somewhat more just for you to give attention to that matter, if you could have somehow made him a better man, and not for you yourself to be a party to the same disreputable conduct, and share your dishonor with his disgrace. What have I done? That which a bad man would do. That is no name of mine. Have you not bought this house from that young man? A pause. Why are you silent? This, where you yourself are now living. He points to the house of Carmides. I did buy it, and I gave the money for it. Forty minae to the young man himself, into his own hand. You gave the money, do you say? T'was done, and I am not sorry t'was done. A faith, a young man committed to untrusty keeping. Have you not by these means given him a sword with which to slay himself? For, prithee, what else is it? Your giving ready money to a young man who loves women and weak in intellect, with which to complete his edifice of folly which he had already commenced. Ought I not to have paid him the money? You ought not to have paid him, nor ought you either to have bought anything of or sold anything to him, nor should you have provided him with the means of becoming worse. Have you not taken in the person who was entrusted to you? Have you not driven out of his house the man who entrusted him to you? By my faith, a pretty trust and a faithful guardianship. Leave him to take care of himself. He would manage his own affairs much better. You overpower me, Megaronides, with your accusations in a manner so strange that what was privately entrusted to my secrecy, fidelity, and constancy, for me to tell it to no one, nor make it public, the same I am now compelled to entrust to you. Whatever you shall entrust to me, you shall take up the same where you have laid it down. Look round you, then, that no overlooker may be near us. Megaronides looks on every side and look around every now and then, I beg of you. I am listening if you have aught to say. If you will be silent, I will speak. At the time when Charmides set out hence for foreign parts, he showed me a treasure in this house, here in a certain closet. He starts as if he hears a noise. But do look around. There is no one. Of Philippian pieces to the number of three thousand, Alone with myself, in tears, he entreated me, by our friendship and by my honor, not to entrust this to his son, nor yet to any one, from whom that might come to his knowledge. Now, if he comes back hither safe, I will restore to him his own. But if anything should happen to him, at all events I have a stock from which to give a marriage portion to his daughter, who has been entrusted to me, that I may settle her in a condition of life that befits her. O oh, ye immortal gods, how soon, in a few words, you have made another man of me. I came to you quite a different person. But, as you have begun, proceed further to inform me. What shall I tell you? How that this worthless fellow had almost utterly ruined his caution and my own trustiness and all the secret? How so? Because, while I was in the country for only six days, in my absence and without my knowledge... Without consulting me, he advertised with bills, this house for sale. The wolf hungered the more, and opened his mouth the wider. He watched till the dog went to sleep, and intended to carry off the whole entire flock. The faith, he would have done it if the dogs had not perceived this in time. 
But now, in my turn, I wish to ask you this. Let me know what it was my duty for me to do. Whether it was right for me to discover the treasure to him, against which very thing his father had cautioned me, or should I have permitted another person to become the owner of this house? Ought that money to have belonged to him who bought the house? In preference, I myself bought the house. I gave the money for the sake of the treasure, that I might deliver it safe to my friend. I have not then bought this house either for myself or for my own use. For Charmides I have bought it back again. From my own store have I paid the money. This, whether it has been done rightfully or wrongfully, I own, Megaronides, that I have done. Here, then, are my misdeeds. Here, then, is my avarice. Is it for these things that they spread false reports against me? Stay. You have overcome your corrector. You have tied my tongue. There is nothing for me to say in answer. Now I entreat you to aid me with your assistance and counsel, and to share this duty of mine in common with me. I promise you my assistance. Where then will you be a short time hence? At home. Do you wish anything else? Attend to the trust reposed in you. That is being carefully done. But how say you? What do you want? Where is the young man living now? This back part of the building he retained when he sold the house. That I wanted to know. Now then, go at once. But what say you? Where is the damsel now? She is at your house, I suppose. She is so. I take care of her almost as much as of my own daughter. You act properly. Before I go away, are you going to ask me anything else? <laughs> Farewell. Exit Calicles. Really, there is nothing more foolish or more stupid, nothing more lying or indeed more tattling, more self-conceited or more forsworn, than those men of this city everlastingly gossiping about, whom they call busybodies. And thus have I enlisted myself in their ranks together with them, who have been the swallower of the false tales of those who pretend that they know everything, and yet know nothing. They know, forsooth, what each person either has in his mind, or is likely to have. They know what the king whispered in the ear of the queen. They know what Juno talked about in conversation with Jupiter. That which neither is, nor is likely to be, do these fellows know. Whether they praise or dispraise any one they please, falsely or truly, they care not a straw, so they know that which they choose to know. All people were in the habit of saying that this Callicles was unworthy of this state, and himself to exist, who had despoiled this young man of his property. From the reports of these talebearers, in my ignorance, I rushed forward to rebuke my guiltless friend. But if the authority was always required from the foundation, upon which they speak of anything they have heard, unless that clearly appeared, the matter ought to be to the peril and loss of the talebearer. If this were so, it would be for the public benefit. I would cause those to be but few, who know that which they do not know, and I would make them have their silly chattering more restricted. Exit. End of Act One. Act Two of Trinumus, The Three Pieces of Money, by Tadeus Machius Plotus, translated by Henry Thomas Riley, eighteen sixteen, eighteen seventy eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act the Second, Scene One. Enter Lysiteles. I am revolving many things in my mind at once, and much uneasiness do I find in thinking upon them. I tease and fret and wear myself out. A mind that enjoins a hard task is now my master. But this thing is not clear to me, nor has it been enough studied by me, which pursuit of these two I should rather follow for myself, which of the two I should think of the greater stability for passing my life therein, whether it were preferable for me to devote myself to love or to aggrandizement, in which alternative there is more enjoyment of life in passing one's days. On this point I am not fully satisfied. 
but this I think I'll do, that I may weigh both the points together, I must be both judge and culprit in this trial. I'll do so, I like it much. First of all, I will enlarge upon the pursuits of love, how they conduce to one's welfare. Love never expects any but the willing man to throw himself in his toils. These he seeks for, these he follows up and craftily counsels against their interests. He is a fawning flatterer, a rapacious grappler, a deceiver, a sweet tooth, a spoiler, a corrupter of men who court retirement, a prior into secrets. For he that is in love, soon as ever he has been smitten with the kisses of the object that he loves, forthwith his substance vanishes out of doors and melts away. Give me this thing, my honey, if you love me, if you possibly can. And then this gudgeon says, O oh, apple of my eye, be it so, both that shall be given you, and still more if you wish it to be given. Then does she strike while he is wavering, and now she begs for more. Not enough is this evil unless there is still something more. What to eat, what to drink, a thing that creates a further expense. The favor of a knight is granted. A whole family is then introduced for her. A wardrobe woman, a perfume keeper, a cofferer, fan bearers, sandal bearers, singing girls, casket keepers, messengers, news carriers. So many wasters of his bread and substance. The lover himself, while to them he is complacent, becomes a beggar. When I revolve these things in my mind, and when I reflect how little one is valued when he is in need, away with you, love, I like you not. No converse do I hold with you. Although tis sweet to feast and to carouse, love still gives bitters enough to be distasteful. He avoids the courts of justice, he drives away your relations, and drives yourself away from your own contemplation. Nor do men wish that he should be called their friend. In a thousand ways is love to be held a stranger, to be kept at a distance, and to be wholly abstained from. For he who plunges into love perishes more dreadfully than if he leapt from a rock. Away with you, love, if you please. Keep your own property to yourself. Love, never be you a friend of mine. Some there are, however, whom in their misery you may keep miserable and wretched, those whom you have easily rendered submissive to yourself. My fixed determination is to apply my mind to my advancement in life, although in that great labor is undergone by the mind. Good men wish these things for themselves. Gain, credit, and honor, glory, and esteem, these are the rewards of the upright. It delights me then the more to live together with the upright rather than with the deceitful promulgators of lies. Scene 2. Enter Flyto. Flyto looking about. Where has this man betaken himself out of doors from the house? Lysiteles coming up to him. I am here, father. Command me what you will, and I shall cause no delay to you, nor will I hide myself in any skulking place out of your sight. You will be doing what is consonant to the rest of your conduct, if you reverence your father. By your duty to me, my son, I wish you, for my sake, not to hold any converse with profligate men, either in the street or in the forum. I know this age, what its manners are. The bad man wishes the good man to be bad, that he may be like himself, the wicked, the rapacious, the covetous, and the envious, disorder and confound the morals of the age. A crew gaping for gain, they hold the sacred thing as profane, the public advantage as the private emolument. But these things do I grieve, these are the matters that torment me. These things am I constantly repeating, both day and night, that you may use a due precaution against them. They only deem it right to keep their hands off that which they cannot touch with their hands. As to the rest, seize it, carry it off, keep it, be off, and go hide. That is the word with them. These things, when I behold them, 
draw tears from me, because I have survived to see such a race of men. Why have I not rather descended to the dead ere this? For these men praise the manners of our ancestors, and defile those same persons whom they commend. With regard, then, to these pursuits, I enjoin you not to taint your disposition with them. Live after my fashion, and according to the ancient manners. What I am prescribing to you, the same do you remember and practice. I have no patience with these fashionable manners, upsetting preconceived notions, with which good men are now disgracing themselves. If you follow these, my instructions, to you, many a good maxim will take root in your breast. From my earliest youth, even up to this present age, I have always, father, paid all submission to the injunctions you have given. So far as my nature was concerned, I considered that I was free. So far as your injunctions were concerned, I deemed it proper that my mind should pay all submission to you. The man who was struggling with his inclination from his earliest age, whether he ought to prefer to be so, as his inclination thinks it proper that he should be, or whether, rather so as his parents and his relations wish him to be, if his inclination conquers that man, it is all over with him. He is the slave of his inclination, and not of himself. But if he conquers his inclination, he truly lives, and shall be famed, as a conqueror of conquerors. If you have conquered your inclination, rather than your inclination you, you have reason to rejoice. Tis better by far that you should be such as you ought to be, than such as pleases your inclination. Those who conquer the inclination will ever be esteemed better men than those whom the inclination subdues. I have ever esteemed these maxims as the shield of my youthful age, never to betake myself to any place where vice was the order of the day, never to go to stroll about at night, nor to take from another that which is his. I have taken all precautions, my father, that I might not cause you uneasiness. I have ever kept your precepts in due preservation by my own rule of conduct. And do you reproach me, because you have acted aright? For yourself have you done so, not for me. My life, indeed, is nearly past. This matter principally concerns your own. Keep on overlaying good deeds with other good deeds, that the rain may not come through. He is the upright man who is not content with it, however upright and however honest he may chance to be. He who readily gives satisfaction to himself is not the upright man, nor is he really honest. He who thinks but meanly of himself in him is there a tendency to well-doing. For this reason, father, I have thought that since there is a certain thing that I wish for, I would request it of you. What is it? I am already longing to give assent. A young man here, of noble family, my friend and year's mate, who has managed his own affairs but heedlessly and unthinkingly. I wish, father, to do him a service, if you are not unwilling. From your own means, I suppose? From my own means. For what is yours is mine, and all mine is yours. What is he doing? Is he in want? He is in want. Has he property? He had. How did he lose it? Was he connected with public business, or with commercial matters? Had he merchandise or wares to sell, when he lost his property? None of these. What, then? I faith, my father, by his good nature. Besides, to indulge his tastes, he wasted some part of it in luxury. By my truth, now, a fellow is spoken of boldly, and as one on familiar terms, one indeed who has never dissipated his fortune by any good means, and is now in want. I cannot brook that, with qualities of that description, he should be your friend. Tis because he is without any bad disposition that I wish to relieve his wants. 
he deserves ill of a beggar who gives him what to eat or to drink if he both loses that which he gives and prolongs for the other a life of misery i do not say this because i am unwilling and would not readily do what you desire but when i apply these expressions to that same person i am warning you beforehand so to have compassion on others that others may not have to pity you i am ashamed to desert him and to deny him aid in his adversity in truth shame is preferable to repentance by just as many letters as it consists of in good sooth father by the care of the gods and of my forefathers and your own i may say that we possess much property honestly obtained if you do a service to a friend it ought not to make you repent that you have done so it ought rather to cause you shame if you do not do it if from great wealth you subtract something does it become more or less less father but do you know what is wont to be repeated to the niggardly citizen that which thou hast mayest thou not have and mayest thou have that misfortune which thou hast not since thou canst neither endure it to be enjoyed by thyself nor by another i know indeed that so it usually is but my son he is the truly niggardly man that has naught with which to pay his dues by the care of the gods we have father both enough for us to enjoy ourselves and with which to do kind offices to kind-hearted men truth i am not able to refuse you anything that you ask of me whose poverty do you wish to relieve speak out boldly to your father that of this young man lesbonicus the son of carmides who lives there he points to the house of carmides why hasn't he devoured both what he had and what he had not censure him not my father many things happen to a man which he likes many too which he does not like troth you say falsely son and you are doing so now not according to your usual wont for the prudent man he faith really frames his own fortunes for himself many things therefore do not happen which he does not like unless he is a bungling workman much labour is requisite for this workmanship in him who seeks to be a clever workman in fashioning his life but he is still very young not by years but by disposition is wisdom acquired age is the relish of wisdom wisdom is the nutriment of old age however come say what you wish now to give him nothing at all father do you only not hinder me from accepting it if he should give anything to me and will you be relieving his poverty by that if you shall accept anything of him by that very means my father faith i wish that you would instruct me in that method certainly do you know of what family he is born i know of an extremely honourable one he has a sister a fine young woman now grown up i wish father to take her without a portion for my wife a wife without a portion just so your riches saved as well by these means you will be conferring an extreme favour on him and in no way could you help him to greater advantage am i to suffer you to take a wife without a portion you must suffer it father and by these means you will be giving an estimable character to our family i could give utterance to many a learned saying and very fluently too this old age of mine retains stories of old and ancient times but since i see that you are courting friendship and esteem for our family although i have been opposed to you i thus give my decision i will permit you ask for the girl and marry her may the gods preserve you to me but to this favour add one thing but what is this one thing i will tell you do you go to him do you solicit him and do you ask for her yourself think of that now you will transact it much more speedily all will be made sure of that you do one word of yours in this matter will be of more consequence than a hundred of mine see now how in my kindness i have undertaken this matter my assistance shall be given 
You really are a kind father. This is the house here he dwells. He points to the house of Carmides. Lesbonicus is his name. Mind and attend to the business. I will await you at home. Exit. Scene 3. Falto alone. These things are not for the best, nor as I think they ought to be. But still, they are better than what is downright bad. For this one circumstance consoles myself and my thoughts. Namely, that he who counsels in the respect to a son nothing else but that which pleases himself alone, only plays the fool. He becomes wretched in mind, and yet he is no nearer bringing it about. He is preparing a very inclement winter for his own old age when he arouses that unseasonable storm. The door of the house of Carmides opens. But the house is open to which I was going. Most conveniently, Lesbonicus himself is coming out of doors with his servant. Falto retires to a distance. Scene 4. Enter Lesbonicus and Stasimus. Tis less than fifteen days since you received from Callicles forty minae for this house. Is it not as I say, Stasimus? When I consider, I think I remember that it was so. What has been done with it? It has been eaten and drunk up, spent away in unguents, washed away in baths. The fishmonger and the baker have carried it off. Butchers, too, and cooks, greengrocers, perfumers, and poulterers. T'was quickly consumed, if faith that money was made away with not less speedily than if you were to throw a poppy among the ants. By my troth! Less has been spent on those items than six minae. Besides, what have you given to your mistresses? That I am including as well in it. Besides, what have I pilfered of it? Aye, that item is a very heavy one. That cannot so appear to you, if you make all due deductions, unless you think that your money is everlasting. Aside. Too late and unwisely, a caution that should have been used before, after he has devoured his substance, he reckons up the account too late. The account, however, of this money is by no means clear. If faith, the account is very clear. The money's gone. Did you not receive forty minhai from Callicles? Did he not receive from you the house in possession? Very good. Filto aside. Truth, I think our neighbour has sold his house. When his father shall come from abroad, his place is in the beggar's gate, unless perchance he should creep into his son's stomach. There were a thousand Olympic drachmae paid to the banker, which you were owing upon account. Those, I suppose, that I was security for? Say, rather, those that I paid down for that young man whom you used to say was so rich. It was so done. Yes, just to be squandered away. That was done as well. But I saw him in a pitiable state, and I did have pity on him. You have pity on others, and you have neither pity nor shame for yourself. Falto aside. It is time to accost him. Is this Filto that is coming here? Troth, tis he himself. If faith, I could wish he was my slave together with his savings. Filto right heartily wishes health to both master and servant, Lesbonicus and Stasimus. May the gods give you, Filto, whatever you may wish for. How is your son? He wishes well to you. In good sooth, he does for me what I do for him in return. Stasimus aside. That phrase, he wishes well, is worthless, unless a person does well too. I too wish to be a free man. I wish in vain. He perhaps might wish to become frugal. He would wish to no purpose. My son has sent me to you to propose an alliance and bond of friendship 
between himself and your family. He wishes to take your sister for his wife. And I have the same feelings, and I desire it. I really don't understand your ways. Amid your prosperity, you are laughing at my adversity. I am a man. You are a man. So may Jupiter love me. I have neither come to laugh at you, nor do I think you deserving of it. But as to what I said, my son begged me to ask for your sister as his wife. It is right that I should know the state of my own circumstances. My position is not on an equal footing with yours. Seek some other alliance for yourselves. Sysamus to Lesbonicus. Are you really sound in mind or intellect to refuse this proposal? For I perceive that he has been found for you a very friend in need. Get away hence and go hang yourself. Faith, if I should commence to go, you would be forbidding me. Unless you want me, Philto, for anything else, I have given you my answer. I trust, Lesbonicus, that you will one day be more obliging to me than I now find you to be. For both to act unwisely and to talk unwisely, Lesbonicus, are sometimes neither of them profitable. Troth, he says what's true. I will tear out your eye if you add one word. Troth, but I will talk, for if I may not be allowed to do so as I am, then I will submit to be called the one-eyed man. Do you now say this, that your position and means are not on an equal footing with ours? I do say so. Well, suppose now you were to come to a building to a public banquet, and a wealthy man, by chance, were to come there as your neighbour. The banquet is set on table, one that they style a public one. Suppose that dainties were heaped up before him by his dependents, and suppose anything pleased you that was so heaped up before him, would you eat, or would you keep your place next to this wealthy man going without your dinner? I should eat, unless he were to forbid me doing so. But I, by my faith, even if he were to forbid me, would eat and cram with both cheeks stuffed out, and what pleased him, that, in especial, would I lay hold of beforehand, nor would I yield to him one jot of my very existence. At table it befits no one to be bashful, for there the decision is about things both divine and human. You say, what is the fact? I will tell you without any subterfuge. I would make place for him on the highway, on the footpath, in the canvas for public honours. But as to what concerns the stomach, by my troth, not this much. Shows the breadth of his fingernail. Unless he should first have thrashed me with his fists. With provisions at the present prices, a feast is a fortune without encumbrances. Always, Lesbonicus, do you take care and think this, that that is the best, according as you yourself are the most deserving. If that you cannot attain to, at least be as near as possible to the most deserving. And now, Lesbonicus, I wish you to grant and accept these terms which I propose and which I ask of you. The gods are rich, Wealth and station befit the gods, but we, poor mortal beings, are, as it were, the salt cellar for the salt of life. The moment that we have breathed forth this, the beggar is held of equal value at Acheron, with the most wealthy man, when dead. Stesimus aside. It will be a wonder if you don't carry your riches there with you. When you are dead, you may perhaps be as good as your name imports. Now that you may understand that position and means have no place here, and that we do not undervalue your alliance, I ask for your sister without a marriage portion. May the matter turn out happily. Do I understand her to be promised? Why are you silent? Oh, immortal gods! 
What a proposal! Why, don't you say? May the gods prosper it. I agree. Stesimus aside. Alas, when there is no advantage in the expression, he used to say, I agree. Now, when there is advantage in it, he is not able to say so. Since you think me, Philto, worthy of an alliance with you, I return you many thanks. But, though this fortune of mine has sadly diminished through my folly, I have, Philto, a piece of land near the city here, that I will give as a portion to my sister. For, after all my follies, that alone, besides my existence, is left me. Really, I care nothing at all about a portion. I am determined to give her one. Stesimus whispers to Lesbonicus. And are you ready, master, to sever that nurse from us which is supporting us? Take care how you do it. What are we ourselves to eat in future? Lesbonicus to Stesimus. Once more, will you hold your tongue? Am I to be rendered accountable to you? Stasimus aside. We are evidently done for, unless I devise something or other. Filto, I want you. He removes to a distance and beckons Filto. If you wish aught, Stasimus. Step a little this way. By all means. I tell you this in secrecy, that neither he nor any one else may learn it of you. Trust me boldly with anything you please. By gods and men, I warn you not to allow that piece of land ever to become yours or your son's. I'll tell you my reasons for this matter. Troth, I should like to hear them. First of all, then, when at any time the ground is being ploughed, in every fifth furrow the oxen die. Preserve me from it. The gate of Acheron is in that land of ours. Then the grapes, before they are ripe, hang in a putrid state. Lesbonicus in a low voice. He is persuading the man to something, I think. Although he is a rogue, still he is not unfaithful to me. Hear the rest. Besides that, when elsewhere the harvest of wheat is most abundant, there it comes up less by one-fourth than what you have sowed. Ah, bad habits ought to be sown on that spot, if in the sowing they can be killed. And never is there any person to whom that piece of land belongs, but that his affairs turn out most unfortunate. Of those to whom it has belonged, some have gone away in banishment, some are dead outright, some again have hanged themselves. See, this man now to whom it belongs, how he has been brought to a regular backgammoned state. Preserve me from this piece of land. Preserve me from it. You would say still more if you were to hear everything from me, for there every other tree has been blasted with lightning. The hogs die. There, most shockingly of inflammation in the throat, the sheep are scabby, as bare of all wool. See, as is this hand of mine, and then, besides, there is not one of the Syrian natives, a race which is the most hardy of men, who could exist there for six months, so surely do all die there of the solstial fever. I believe, Stasimus, that it is so, but the Campanian race much outdoes that of the Syrians in hardiness. But really... That piece of land, as I have heard you describe it, is one to which it were proper for all wicked men to be sent for the public good, just as they tell of the islands of the blessed, where all meet together who have passed their lives uprightly. 
On the other hand, it seems proper that all evildoers should be packed off there, since it is the place of such a character. Tis a very receptacle of calamity. What need is there of many words? Look for any bad thing whatsoever there, you may find it. But, i faith, you may find it there, and elsewhere, too. Please take care not to say that I told you of this. You have told it me in perfect secrecy. For he, indeed, pointing at Lesbonicus, wishes it to be got rid of from himself, if he can find any one to impose upon about it. If faith, this land shall never become my property. Aye, if you keep in your senses. Aside. If faith, I have cleverly frightened the old fellow away from this land. For if my master had parted with it, there is nothing for us to live upon. Lesbonicus, I now return to you. Tell me, if you please, what has he been saying to you? What do you suppose? He is a man. He wishes to become a free man, but he has not the money to give. And I wish to be rich, but all in vain. Stesimus aside. You might have been if you had chosen now, since you have nothing. You cannot be. What are you talking about to yourself, Stasimus? About that which you were saying just now. If you had chosen formerly, you might have been rich. Now you are wishing too late. No terms can be come to with me about the marriage portion. Whatever pleases you, do you transact it yourself with my son. Now, I ask for your sister for my son. And may the matter turn out well. What now? Are you still considering? What about that matter? Since you will have it so, may the gods prosper it. I promise her. Never, by my truth, was a son born so ardently longed for by any one, as was that expression, I promise her, when born for me. The gods will prosper all your plans. So I wish. Come this way with me, Lesbonicus, that a day may be agreed on for the nuptials, in the presence of Lysitales. This agreement we will ratify on that same day. Exit Phaelto. Now, Stasimus, go you there. Points to the house which he has sold to Callicles. To the house of Callicles, to my sister. Tell her how this matter has been arranged. I will go. And congratulate my sister. Very well. Tell Callicles to meet me. But rather do you go now. That he may see what is necessary to be done about the portion. Do go now. For I have determined not to give her without a portion. But rather do you go now. And I will never allow it to be a detriment to her by reason of... Do be off now. My recklessness. Do go now. It seems by no means just, but that, since I have done wrong... Do go now. It should be chiefly a detriment to myself. Do go now. Oh, my father, and shall I ever see you again? Do go now. Go, go now. I am going. Do you take care of that which I have asked you? I shall be here directly. Exit Lesbonicus. Scene 5. Stesimus. At length I have prevailed on him to go. In the name of the immortal gods, if faith, tis a matter well managed by wrongful means of performance, inasmuch as our piece of land is safe, although even now tis still a very doubtful matter what may be the result of this affair. But if the land is parted with, tis all over with my neck. I must carry a buckler in foreign lands, a helmet too, and my baggage. 
He will be running away from the city when the nuptials have been celebrated. He will be going hence to extreme and utter ruin somewhere or other to serve as a soldier either to Asia or Cilicia. I will go there. Looking at the door of the house bought by Calicles. Where he has ordered me to go, although I detest this house ever since he has driven us out of our abode. Exit into the house of Carmides. End of Act Two. Act Three of Trinumus, The Three Pieces of Money by Titus Maxius Plautus, translated by Henry Thomas Riley, 1816-1878. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act the Third, Scene One. Enter Cleicles and Stasimus. To what effect were you speaking about this, Stasimus? That Lesbonicus, the son of my master, has betrothed his sister in those terms. To what person has he betrothed her? To Lysiteles, the son of Philto, without a portion, too. Without a portion? Will he marry her into a family so rich? You are telling me a thing not to be credited. Why, Faith? You would be for never believing. If you don't believe this, at all events, I shall be believing... What? That I don't care a fig for your belief. How long since or where was this matter agreed to? On this very spot, here, before his door. Pointing at Philto's house. This moment, like, as the man of Prineste says... And has Lesbonicus, admit his ruined fortunes, become so more frugal than in his prosperous circumstances? Why, in fact, Philto himself came of his own accord to make the offer for his son. Calicles aside. By my troth, it really will be a disgrace if a portion is not given to the maiden. In fine, I think, of faith, that that matter concerns myself. I will go to my corrector and will ask advice of him. Exit. I pretty nearly guess, and I have a strong suspicion why he makes such speed on this, namely, that he may turn Lesbonicus out of his bit of land after he has turned him out of his house. O oh, Carmides, my master, since your property here is being torn to pieces in your absence, I wish I could see you return safe, that you might both take vengeance on your enemies, and give the reward to me, according as I have behaved, and do behave towards you. Tis an extremely difficult thing for a friend, to be found really such as the name imports, to whom, when you have entrusted your interests, you may sleep without any care. But, lo, I perceive our son-in-law coming, together with his neighbour. Something, what I know not, is wrong between them. They are walking, each with a hasty step. The one is catching the other that is before him by the cloak. They have come to a stop in no very courteous fashion. I'll step aside here a little distance, I have a wish to hear the conversation of these two that are to be connected by marriage. He retires to a distance. Scene two. Enter Lysisteles and Lesbonicus. Stay this moment. Don't turn away and don't hide yourself from me. He catches hold of his cloak. Lesbonicus shaking him off. Can't you allow me to go whither I was proceeding? If, Lesbonicus, it seems to be your interest, either for your glory or for your honor, I will let you go. You are doing a thing that is very easy to do. What is that? 
an injury to a friend. It is no way of mine, and I have not learned so to do. Untaught as you are, how cleverly you do it. What would you have done if anyone had taught you to be thus annoying to me? You, who, when you pretend to be acting kindly to me, use me ill and are intending evil. What? I? Yes, you. How do I use you ill? Inasmuch as you do that which I do not wish. I wish to consult your advantage. Are you kinder to me than I am to myself? I have sense enough. I see sufficiently well those things that are for my own advantage. And is it having sense enough to refuse a kindness from a well-wisher? I reckon it to be no kindness when it does not please him on whom you are conferring it. I know, and I understand myself, what I am doing, and my mind forsakes not its duty, nor will I be driven by your speeches from paying due regard to my own character. What do you say? For now I cannot be restrained from saying to you the things which you deserve. Have your forefathers, I pray, so handed down this reputation to you that you, by your excesses, might lose what before was gained by their merit, and that you might become a bar to the honor of your own posterity? Your father and your grandfather made an easy and a level path for you to attain to honor, whereas you have made it to become a difficult one by your extreme recklessness and sloth and your besotted ways. You have made your election to prefer your passions to virtue. Now, do you suppose that you can cover over your faults by these means? Alas, tis impossible! Welcome virtue to your mind, if you please, and expel slothfulness from your heart. Give your attention to your he-friends in the courts of justice, and not to the couch of your she-friend as you are wont to do. And earnestly do I now wish this piece of land to be left to you for this reason that you may have wherewithal to reform yourself, so that those citizens whom you have for enemies may not be able altogether to throw your poverty in your teeth. All these things which you have been saying, I know, could even set my seal to them, how I have spoiled my patrimonial estate and the fair fame of my forefathers. I knew how it became me to live. To my misfortune, I was not able to act accordingly, Thus, overpowered by the force of passion, inclined to ease, I fell into the snare, and now, to you, quite as you deserve, I do return most hearty thanks. Still, I cannot suffer my labor to be thus lost, and yourself to despise these words. At the same time, it grieves me that you have so little shame. And, in fine, unless you listen to me, and do this that I mention, you yourself will easily lie concealed behind your own self, so that honor cannot find you. When you will wish yourself to be especially distinguished, you will be lying in obscurity. I know right well for my part, Lisbonicus, your highly ingenuous disposition. I know that of your own accord you have not done wrong, but that it is love that has blinded your heart, and I myself comprehend all the ways of love. As the charge of the ballista is hurled, so is love. Nothing is there so swift or that so swiftly flies. He too makes the manners of men both foolish and froward. That which is most commended pleases him the least. That from which he is dissuaded pleases him. When there is a scarcity, then you long for a thing. When there is an abundance of it, then you don't care for it. The person that warns him off from a thing, the same invites him. He that persuades him to it interdicts him. "'Tis a misfortune of insanity for you to fly to Cupid for refuge. "'But I advise you again and again to think of this, how you should seek to act. "'If you attempt to do according as you are now showing signs, "'you will cause the conflagration of your family, "'and then, in consequence, you will have a desire for water "'with which to quench this conflagration of your family. "'And if you should obtain it, just as lovers are subtle in their devices, you will not leave even one spark with which your family may brighten up. Tis easy to be found. Fire is granted, even though you should ask it of a fool. But you, by your reproof, are urging me from my faults to a viler course. You are persuading me to give you my sister without a portion. 
but it does not become me, who have misused so great a patrimony, to be still in affluent circumstances and to be possessing land, but her to be in want, so as with good reason to detest me. Never will he be respected by others who makes himself despised by his own relatives. As I said, I will do. I do not wish you to be in doubt any longer. And is it so much preferable that for your sister's sake you should incur poverty, and that I should possess that piece of land rather than yourself, who ought to be upholding your own walls? I do not wish you so much to have regard to myself, in order that you may relieve my poverty, as that in my neediness I may not become disgraced. That people may not spread about this report of me, that I gave my own sister without a portion to you, rather in concubinage than in marriage. Who would be said to be more dishonorable than I? The spreading of this report may do credit to you, but it would defile me if you were to marry her without a portion. For you it would be a gain of reputation. For me it would be something for people to throw in my teeth. Why so? Do you suppose that you will become dictator if I accept the land of you? I neither wish nor require, nor do I think so. But still, to be mindful of his duty is true honor to an upright man. For my part, I know you, how you are disposed in mind. I see it, I discover it, I apprehend. You are doing this, that when you have formed an alliance between us, and when you have given up this piece of land, and have nothing here with which to support life, in beggary you may fly from the city, in exile you may desert your country, your kindred, your connections, your friends, the nuptials once over. People would suppose that you were frightened hence by my means and through my cupidity. Do not fancy in your mind that I will act so as to allow that to happen. Says Stimus, advancing. Well, I cannot but exclaim, well done, well done, Lysiteles, encore. Easily do you win the victory. The other is conquered. Your performance is superior. This one, pointing at Lysistelis, acts better in character and composes better lines. By reason of your folly, do you still dispute it? Stand in awe of the fine. What means this interruption of yours, or your intrusion here upon our conversation? The same way that I came here, I'll get me gone. Step this way home with me, Lysitilis. There we will talk at length about these matters. I am not in the habit of doing anything in secret. Just as my feelings are, I will speak out. If your sister, as I think it right, is thus given to me in marriage without a portion, and if you are not about to go away hence, that which shall be mine, the same shall be yours. But if you are minded otherwise, May that which you do turn out for you for the best. I will never be your friend on any other terms. Such is my determination. Exit Lesbonicus, followed by Lysistoles. Scene 3. Stasimus. Faith, he's off. Do you hear, Lysistoles? I want you. He's off as well. Stasimus, you remain alone. What am I now to do? but to buckle up my baggage and sling my buckler on my back and order soles to be fastened beneath my shoes. There is no staying now. I see that no long time hence I shall be a soldier's drudge. And when my master has thrown himself into the pay of some potentate, I guess that among the greatest warriors he will prove a brave hand at running away, and that there he will capture the spoil who shall come to attack my master. I myself, the moment that I shall have assumed my bow and quiver and arrows and helmet on my head, shall go to sleep very quietly in my tent. I'll be off to the forum. I'll ask that talent back of the person to whom I lent it six days since, that I may have some provision for the journey to carry with me. Exit. Scene 4. Enter Megalonides and Callicles. 
According as you relate the matter to me, Callicles, it really can by no means be but that a portion must be given to the girl. Why, troth, it would hardly be honestly done on my part, if I were to allow her to contract a marriage without a portion, when I have her property in my possession at home. A portion is ready at your house. Unless you like to wait until her brother has disposed of her in marriage without a portion. After that, you might go to Filto yourself, and might say that you present her with a portion, and that you do it on account of your intimacy with her father. But I dread this, lest that offer might bring you into crimination and disgrace with the public. They would say that you were so kind to the girl, not without some good reason, that the dowry which you presented her was given you by her father. They would think that you were portioning her out of that, and that you had not kept it safe for her just as it was given, and that you had withheld some part. Now, if you wish to await the return of Carmides, the time is very long. Meanwhile, the inclination to marry her may leave this Lysitelis. This proposal, too, is quite a first-rate one for her. All these very same things suggest themselves to my mind. Consider if you think this more feasible and more to the purpose. Go to the young man himself, and tell him how the matter really stands. Should I now discover the treasure to a young man, ill-regulated and brimful of passion and of wantonness? No, Faith, most assuredly, by no means. For I know beyond a doubt that he would devour even all that spot where it is buried. I fear to dig for it, lest he should hear the noise lest, too, he might trace out the matter itself, if I should say I will give her a portion. By what method, then, can the portion be secretly taken out? Until an opportunity can be found for that business, I would, in the meanwhile, ask for a loan of the money from some friend or other. Can it be obtained from some friend or other? It can. Nonsense. You'll certainly meet with this answer at once. Oh, upon my faith. I really have not anything that I can lend you. Troth, I would rather they would tell me the truth than lend me the money with a bad grace. But consider this plan, if it pleases you. What is the plan? I have found out a clever plan, as I think. What is it? Let some person now be hired of an appearance as much unknown as possible, such as has not often been seen. Let this person be dressed up to the life after a foreign fashion just as though he were a foreigner. What is he to understand that he must do after that? It is necessary for him to be some lying, deceiving, impudent fellow, a lounger from the forum. And then what after that? Let him come to the young man as though from Seleucia, from his father. Let him pronounce his salutation to him in the words of his father. Say that he is prospering in business and is alive and well, and that he will be shortly coming back again. Let him bring two letters. Let us seal these as though they are from his father. Let him give the one to him, and let him say that he wishes to give the other to yourself. Go on and tell me still further. Let him say that he is bringing some gold as a marriage portion from her father for the girl, and that his father has requested him to deliver it to you. Do you understand me now? Pretty nearly, and I listen with great satisfaction. Then, in consequence you will finally give the gold to the young man when the girl shall be given in marriage. Troth, tis very cleverly contrived. By this means, when you have dug up the treasure, you will have removed all cause for suspicion from the young man. He will think that the gold has been brought to you from his father, whereas you will be taking it from the treasure. Very cleverly and fairly contrived, although I am ashamed at this time of life for me to be playing a double part. But when he shall bring the letter sealed, don't you suppose that the young man will then recollect the impression of his father's signet? Will you be silent now? Reasons innumerable may be found for that circumstance. That which he used to have, he has lost, and he has since had another new one made. Then, if he should bring them not sealed at all, this might be said, that they had been unsealed for him by the custom house officers, and had been examined. On matters of this kind, however, Tis mere idleness to spend the day in talk, although a long discussion might be spun out. Go now, at once, privately, to the treasure. Send to a distance the men-servants and the maids, and 
Do you hear? What is it? Take care that you conceal this matter from that same wife of yours as well. For, a faith, there is never any subject which they can be silent upon. Why are you standing now? Why don't you take yourself off? Hence, and bestir yourself. Open the treasure. Take thence as much gold as is requisite for this purpose. At once close it up again. But secretly, as I have enjoined you, turn all out of the house. I will do so. But... Really, we are continuing too long a discourse. We are wasting the day. Whereas, there is need now of all expedition. There is nothing for you to fear about the seal. Trust me for that. This is a clever excuse to give, as I mentioned, that they have been looked at by the officers. In fine, don't you see the time of day? What do you think of him being of such a nature and disposition? He is drunk already. Anything you like may be proved for him. Besides, what is the greatest point of all, this person will say that he brings, and not that he applies for, money. Now, that's enough. I am now going to hire a sharper from the forum, and then I will seal the two letters, and I'll send him thither. Pointing to the house of Carmides. Well tutored in his part, to this young man. I am going indoors, then, to my duty in consequence. Do you see about this matter? I'll take care it's done in the very cleverest style. Exit. End of Act 3. Act 4 of Trinumus, The Three Pieces of Money, by Titus Maxius Plotus. Translated by Henry Thomas Riley, 1816-1878. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act the Fourth, Scene One. Enter Carmides. To Neptune, potent o'er the deep and most powerful, the brother of ethereal Jove, joyously and sincerely do I proffer praise and return my grateful thanks. To the salt waves, too, for whom lay supreme power over myself. One, too, that existed over my property and my life, inasmuch as from their realms they have returned me safe and sound even to my own native city. And Neptune, before the other deities, do I both give and return to you extreme thanks. For all people talk of you as being cruel and severe, of voracious habits, filthy, unsightly, unendurable, and outrageous. On the other hand, I have experienced your kindly aid. For, in good sooth, I have found you mild and merciful upon the deep, even to that degree that I wished. This commendation, too, I had already heard with these ears before of you among men, that you were accustomed to spare the poor and to depress and overawe the rich. Adieu, I commend you. You know how to treat men properly, according as is just. This is worthy of the gods. They should ever prove indignant to the needy, to men of high station quite otherwise. Trusty have you proved, though they are in the habit of saying that you cannot be trusted. For without you, it would have happened, I am very sure, that on the deep your attendants would have shockingly torn in pieces and rent asunder wretched me, and together with me, my property as well, in every direction throughout the azure surface of ocean. But just now, like raging dogs, and no otherwise, did the winds and hurricane beset the ship? Storms and waves and raging squalls were about to roar, to break the mast, to bear down the yards, to split the sails, had not your favoring kindness been nigh at hand. Have done with me, if you please. Henceforth have I now determined to give myself up to ease. Enough have I got. With what pains have I struggled while I was acquiring riches for my son? But who is this that is coming up the street, 
with his new-fangled garb and appearance. In faith, though I wish to be at home, I'll wait a while. At the same time, I will give my attention to see what business this fellow is about. He retires aside. Scene 2. Enter the Sharper. To this day, I'll give the name the Festival of the Three Pieces, Trinumus. For on this day, I have let out my services in a cheating scheme for three pieces of money. I am just arrived from Seleucia, Macedonia, Asia, and Arabia, places which I never visited either with my eye or with my foot. See now what business poverty brings upon the man that is wretchedly destitute. Inasmuch as I am now obliged, for the sake of three pieces of money, to say that I received these letters from a certain person, about whom I don't know, nor have I ever known, who the man is, nor do I know this for certain, whether he was ever born or not. Carmides behind. Faith, this fellow surely of the mushroom genus, he covers himself entirely with his top. The countenance of the fellow appears to be a Rillian. He comes, too, in that garb. He who hired me, when he had hired me, took me to his house. He told me what he wanted to be done. He taught me and showed me beforehand how I was to do everything. If then I should add anything more, my employer will on that account the better forward his plans through me. As he dressed me out, so I am now equipped. His money did that. He himself borrowed my costume, at his own risk, from the theatrical wardrobe. If I shall be able now to impose on this man through my garb, I will give him occasion clearly to find that I am a very trickster. Carmides behind. The more I look at him, the less does the appearance of the fellow please me. Tis a wonder if that fellow there is not either a night robber or a cut purse. He is viewing the locality. He is looking around him and surveying the houses. Troth. I think he is reconnoitering the spot for him to come and rob by and by. I have a still greater desire to watch what he is about. I'll give attention to this matter. This employer of mine pointed out these localities to me. At this house are my devices to be put in practice. I'll knock on the door. Carmides behind. Surely this fellow is making in a straight line from my house. In faith, I think I shall have to keep watch this night of my arrival. Sharper knocks at the door of the house of Cremides. Open this door. Open it. Hello there. Who now has the care of this door? Carmides coming up to him. Young man, what do you want? What is it you wish? Why are you knocking at this door? Hey, old gentleman. I am inquiring here for a young man named Lesbonicus, where in this quarter he lives, and likewise for another person, with such white hairs on his head as yours, he that gave me these letters said his name was Callicles. Carmides aside. In fact, this fellow is looking for my own son Lesbonicus, and my friend Callicles to whom I entrusted both my children and my property. Let me know, respected sir, if you are acquainted with it, where these persons live. Why are you inquiring for them? Or who are you? Or whence are you? Or whence do you come? I gave the return correctly to the censor when I was questioned by him. You ask a number of things in the same breath. I know not which in especial to inform you upon. If you will ask each thing singly, and in a quiet manner, I'll both let you know my name 
and my business and my travels. I'll do as you desire. Come then, in the first place, tell me your name. You begin by demanding an arduous task. How so? Because, respected sir, if you were to begin before daylight, ye faith, to commence at the first part of my name, twould be the dead of night before you could get to the end of it. According to your story, a person should have a long journey's provision crammed tightly in for your name. I have another name, somewhat less, about the size of a wine cask. What is this name of yours, young man? Hush, that's my name. That's my everyday one. In faith, tis a scampish name. Just as though you were to say, Hush, if I were confiding anything to you, and then it is at an end forthwith. Aside. This fellow is evidently a sharper. What say you, young man? What is it now? Speak out. What do these persons owe you whom you are seeking? The father of this young man, Les Bonicus, delivered to me these two letters. He is a friend of mine. Carmides aside. I have now caught him in the fact. He says that I gave him the letters. I will have some fine sport with the fellow. As I have begun, if you will give attention, I will say on. I'll give you my attention. He bade me give this letter to his son, Lesbonicus, and this other one as well, he bade me give to his friend, Callicles. Carmides aside. Troth. But since he is acting the impostor, I, on the other hand, have an inclination to act the cheat as well. Where was he himself? He was carrying on his business prosperously. But where? At Seleucia. And did you receive these from himself? With his own hands he himself delivered them into my hands. Of what appearance is this person? He is a person somewhat about a foot taller than you. Carmides aside. This is an odd matter, if in fact I am taller when absent than when present. Do you know this person? You are asking me a ridiculous question. Together with him, I was in the habit of taking my meals. What is his name? One, e faith, that belongs to an honourable man. I would like to hear it. Troth, his name... His, his... Aside. Woe to unfortunate me. What's the matter? Unguardedly, I this moment swallowed the name. I like not the man that has his friend shut up within his teeth. And yet this moment was dwelling on the very edge of my lips. Carmides aside. I've come today in good time before this fellow. Sharper aside. To my sorrow, I'm caught in the fact. Have you now recollected the name? For gods and men, e faith, I'm ashamed of myself. See, now, how well you know this man. As well as my own self. This is in the habit of happening. The thing you are holding in your hand and seeing with your eyes that same you are looking for as lost. I'll recollect it letter by letter. C is the beginning of the name. Is it Callias? No, it isn't that. Callipus? It isn't that. Calidemides? It isn't that. Callinicus? No, it isn't that. Or is it Callimachus? "'Tis in vain you suggest. "'And, e faith, I really don't care one Philip about it, "'since I recollect enough myself for my own purpose.' "'But there are many people here of the name of Labonicus. "'Unless you tell me the name of his father, 
I cannot show you these persons whom you are looking for. What is it like? Perhaps we can find it out by guessing. It is something like that. Char... Chares? Or Charicles? Or is it Charmides? Ah, uh, that's he. May the deities confound him. I have said to you once before already that it is proper for you rather to speak well of a man that is your friend than to curse him. Isn't it the fact that this most worthless fellow has lain perdu between my lips and my teeth? Don't you be cursing an absent friend. Why, then, did this most rascally fellow hide himself away from me? If you had only called him, he would have answered to his name. But where is he himself now? Troth, I left him at Radama, in the Isle of Apeland. Carmides, aside. What person is there a greater simpleton than I, who myself am making inquiries where I am? But it is by no means unimportant to this present purpose. What do you say as... What now? I ask you this. What places have you visited? Places exceedingly wonderful in astonishing ways. I should like to hear about them, unless it is inconvenient. Really, I quite long to tell you. First of all, we were conveyed to Pontus in the land of Arabia. How now? Is Arabia then in Pontus? He is. Not that Arabia where frankincense is produced but where the wormwood grows, and the wild marjoram which the poultry love. Carmides aside. An extremely ingenious knave, this. But the greater simpleton I, to be asking of this fellow from what place I have come back, a thing which I know, and he does not know, except that I have a mind to try how he will get out of it at last. But what say you further? Whither did you go next from thence? If you give me your attention, I will tell you. To the source of the river which arises out of the heavens from beneath the throne of Jupiter. Beneath the throne of Jupiter? Yes, I say so. Out of the heavens? Aye, out of the very middle. How now? And did you ascend even to the heavens? Yes. We were carried in a little skiff right on up the river against the tide. And did you see Jupiter as well? The other god said that he had gone to his country house to dole out the victuals for his slaves. Then after that... Then after that, I don't want you to relate anything more. Troth, I'm silent if it's troublesome. Why, no decent person ought to tell it, who has gone from the earth to heaven. I'll leave you as I see you wish it. But point me out these persons whom I'm looking for, and to whom I must deliver these letters. What say you? If now perchance you were to see Charmides himself, him, I mean, who you say gave you these letters, would you know the man? By my truth, now, you do take me to be a brute beast who really am not able to recognize the person with whom I have been spending my life. And would he have been such a fool as to entrust to me a thousand Philippian pieces, which gold he bade me carry to his son and to his friend Callicles, to whom he said that he had entrusted his affairs. Would he have entrusted them to me if he had not known me, and I him, very intimately? Carmides aside. I really have a longing now to swindle this swindler, if I can cousin him out of these thousand Philippian pieces which he has said that I have given to him. A person that I know not who he is, and have never beheld him with my eyes before this day. Should I be entrusting gold to him? 
a man to whom, if his life were at stake, I would not entrust a dump of lead. This fellow must be adroitly dealt with by me. Hello, uh, Mr. Hush, I want three words with you. Even three hundred, if you like. Have you that gold which you received from Charmides? Yes, and Philippians too, counted out on the table with his own hand, a thousand pieces. You received it, you mean, from Charmides himself? Twere a wonder if I had received it of his father, or of his grandfather, who are dead. Then, young man, hand me over this gold. Sharper staring at him. What gold am I to give you? That which you have owned you received from me. Received from you? Yes, I say so. Who are you? I am Charmides, who gave you the thousand pieces of money. E faith, you are not he. And this day you never shall be he, for this gold at any rate. Away with you, if you please, you impostor. Aside. You are trying to cheat the cheater. I am Charmides. E faith, you are so to no purpose, for I carry no gold. Right cleverly were you down upon me at the very nick of time. After I had said that I was bringing the gold, that instant you became Charmides. Before I made mention of the gold, you were not he. It won't do. Just therefore, in such a manner as you charmidized yourself, do you again uncharmidize yourself. Who am I, then, if in fact I am not he whom I really am? What matters that to me? So long as you are not he whom I do not choose you to be, you may be who you like, for all I care. Just now you were not he who you were. Now you are become he who then you were not. Come, dispatch, if you are going to do it. What am I to do? Give me back the gold. You are dreaming, old gentleman. Do you own that Charmides delivered the gold to you? Yes, in writing. Are you making haste or not, you night robber, to be off with all speed this very instant, from this neighborhood, before I order you to be soundly cudgeled on the spot? For what reason? Because I am that self-same Charmides about whom you have been thus lying, and who you said gave the letters to you. How oh, now? Prithee, are you really he? I really am he. Say you so, pray? Are you really he himself? I do say so. Are you his own self? His own self, I say. I am Charmides. And are you then his own self? His own very self. Be gone hence out of my sight. Since you really have made your appearance here thus late, you shall be beaten both at my own award and that of the new Aedile. And you are abusing me as well? Yes. Seeing that you have arrived in safety, may the gods confound me if I care a straw for you, had you perished first. I have received the money for this job, you I devote to bad luck. But who you are, or who you are not, I care not one jot. I'll go and carry word to him who gave me the three pieces, that he may know that he has thrown them away. I'm off. Live with a curse and fare you ill. May all the gods confound you, Charmides, for coming from abroad. Exit. Scene three. Carmides. Since this fellow has gone, at least a time and opportunity seem to have arrived for speaking out without restraint. Already does this sting pierce my breast. What business could he have before my house? 
for these letters summon apprehensions into my heart. These thousand pieces, too, what purpose they were to serve. In faith, a bell is never rung for no purpose. Unless someone handles it or moves it, tis mute, tis dumb. But who is this that is beginning to run this way along the street? I should like to observe what he is about. I'll step aside this way. He retires aside. Scene four. Enter Stasimus to himself. Stasimus, make you haste with all speed. Away with you to your master's house, lest on a sudden, through your folly, fears should arise for your shoulder blades. Quicken your pace. Make haste. Tis now a long while since you left the house. If you shall be absent when inquired after by your master, take you care, please, that the smacks of the bull's hide don't clatter thick upon you. Don't you cease running. See now, Stasimus, what a worthless fellow you are. And isn't it the fact that you have forgotten your ring at the liquor shop after you have been washing your throat with warm drink? Turn about and run back now to seek it while the thing has but just happened. Carmides behind. Whoever he is, his throat is his taskmaster. That teaches this fellow the art of running. What, good-for-nothing fellow? Are you not ashamed of yourself? Having lost your memory after only three cups? And really, because you were there drinking together with such honest fellows who could keep their hands off the property of another without difficulty is it among such men that you expect you may recover your ring Chiricus was there sasonicus crimnus chrysolabus colalabus whipped necks whipped legs iron rubbers whipped knaves by my faith any one of these could steal the sole of his shoe from a running footman. Carmides behind. So may the gods love me, a Finnish thief. Why should I go seek what is gone forever, unless I would bestow my pains too by way of addition over and above to my loss? Why then don't you consider that what is gone is gone. Tack about, then. Betake yourself back to your master. Carmides behind. This fellow is no runaway. He remembers his home. I wish that the old-fashioned ways of old-fashioned days and the old-fashioned thriftiness were in greater esteem here rather than these bad ways. Carmides behind. Immortal gods! This man really is beginning to talk of noble things. He longs for the old-fashioned ways. Know that he loves the old-fashioned ways after the fashion of our forefathers. For nowadays, men's manners reckon of no value what is proper, except what is agreeable. Ambition now is sanctioned by usage and is free from the laws. By usage people have the license to throw away their shields and to run away from the enemy, to seek honour thereby in place of disgrace is the usage. Carmides behind. A shameless usage. Nowadays tis the usage to neglect the brave. Carmides behind. Ah, it is really shocking. The public manners have now got the laws in their power. To them they are more submissive than our parents to their children. In their misery, these laws are even hung up against the wall with iron nails, where it has been much more becoming for bad ways to be fixed up. Carmides behind. I'd like to go up and accost this person, but I listen to him with much pleasure, and I'm afraid, if I address him, 
that he may begin to talk on some other subject. And for these ways there is nothing rendered sacred by the law. The laws are subservient to usage, but these habits are hastening to sweep away both what is sacred and what is public property. Carmides behind. By my troth, twere right for some great calamity to befall these bad customs. Ought not this state of things to be publicly censured? For this kind of men are the enemies of all persons, and do an injury to the entire people. By a non-observance of their own honour, they likewise destroy all trust, even in those who merit it not, inasmuch as people form an estimate of the disposition of these from the disposition of those fellows. If you lend a person any money, it becomes lost for any purpose as one's own. When you ask for it back again, you may find a friend made an enemy by your kindness. If you begin to press still further, the option of two things ensues. Either you must part with that which you have entrusted, or else you must lose that friend. As to how this suggests itself to me, I have by actual experience been lately put in mind of it. Carmides behind. Surely this is my servant's Decimus. For as to him to whom I lent the talent, I bought myself an enemy with my talent, and sold my friend, but I am too great a simpleton to be attending to public matters rather than, what's my immediate interest, obtain safety for my back. I'll go home. Moves as if going. Hello, you! Stop this instant. Clarky, hello you. I'll not stop. I want you. What if I myself don't want you to want me? Why, Stasimus, you are behaving very rudely. Twere better for you to buy someone to give your commands to. In faith, I have bought one and paid the money too. But if he is not obedient to my orders, what am I to do? Give him a severe punishment. You give good advice. I am resolved to do so. Unless, indeed, you are under obligations to him. If he is a deserving person, I am under obligations to him. But if he is otherwise, I'll do as you advise me. What matters it to me whether you have good or bad slaves? Because you have a share in this matter, both of the good and of the bad. The one share I leave to yourself, the other share that is in the good, do you set down to my account. If you shall prove deserving, it shall be so. Look back at me. I am Charmides. Ha! What person is it that has made mention of that most worthy man? Tis that most worthy man himself. O oh, seas, earth, heavens, by my trust in you, do I see quite clearly with my eyes? Is this he, or is it not? Tis he, tis certainly he, tis he beyond a doubt. Oh, my most earnestly wished for master, health to you. Health to you too, Stesimus. That you are safe and sound, I... I know it, and I believe you. But wave the rest. Answer me this. How are my children, my son and daughter, whom I left here? They are alive and well. Both of them, say you? Both of them. The gods willed me to be safe and preserved from dangers. The rest that I want to know I will inquire about indoors at my leisure. Let us go indoors. Follow me. Where are you going now? Where else but to my house? Do you suppose that we are living here? Why, where else should I suppose? Now? What about now? This house is not our own. What is it I hear from you? 
Your son has sold this house. I'm ruined? For silver minai, ready money counted out. How many? Forty. I'm undone. Who has purchased it? Callicles, to whom you entrusted your affairs. He has removed here to live, and has turned us out of doors. Where is my son now living? Here, in these back buildings. Points to the side of the house. I'm utterly undone. I thought that this would be distressing to you when you heard of it. To my sorrow, amid extreme dangers I have been borne over vast oceans. With the peril of my life I have preserved myself among robbers full many in number, and I have returned safe. Now, to my misery, I am here undone, by reason of those same persons for whose sake I have been struggling at this time of life. Grief is depriving me of my senses. Support me, Stesimus. Do you wish me to fetch you some water? When my fortunes were in their mortal struggle, then it was befitting that water should be sprinkled upon them. Scene 5. Enter Callicles. What noise is this that I hear before my house? Oh, Callicles! Oh, Callicles! Oh, Callicles! To what sort of person have I entrusted my property? To one good and faithful and trusty, and of strict integrity. Health to you, and I rejoice that you have arrived safe and sound. How health to me! Troth, I have no patience for such health. This I wish to know. How have you kept your trust, who, without my knowledge have utterly destroyed my property and my children that I entrusted to you and committed to your charge when going hence abroad. I don't think that is fair, when you don't understand the matter, to censure your old friend with harsh words. For you are both mistaken, and you are doing me a great injustice. Have you not bought this house which you came out of just now, and driven thence my son Lesbonicus? Is this so as I say, or is it not? Answer me. I myself did buy the house. I bought it that I might keep it for you. And without that, it would have happened that your son would have sold it to another person, and then you would have lost both it and that treasure together, which concealed there you had entrusted to my charge. See, I restore it safe to you. For you did I buy it, not for myself. Prithee, what do you say? By my trust in gods and men, you make me suddenly to be quite ashamed of my error in speaking unkindly to my friend in return for his services. How then? Do you now think that I am trusty and faithful? I do think so, if all these matters are so as you relate them. But what means this garb of yours? I'll tell you. I was digging up the treasure indoors as a marriage portion to be given to your daughter. But I will relate to you both this and the rest in the house. Follow me. Stasimus? Well? Run with all haste to the Pyrrhus, and make but one run of it. There you will at once see the ship, on board of which I was carried hither. Bid Sigario take care that the things are brought which I enjoined him, and do you go together with them. The duty has already been paid to the customs house officer. I make no delay. Get you gone with all speed, and be back directly. I am both there and here in an instant. Callicles to Carmides. Do you follow me this way indoors? I follow. Exit Callicles and Carmides into the house. This man alone has remained a firm friend to my master, nor has he allowed his mind to swerve from unshaken fidelity although I believe that he has undergone many troubles by reason of the property and the children of my master. Still, this person, as I suspect, alone has maintained his fidelity. Exit. End of Act 4. Act 5 of Trinimus. The Three Pieces of Money by Titus Maxius Plautus Translated by Henry Thomas Riley 
1816-1878. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act the Fifth, Scene One. Enter by Cytales. This individual is the very first of all men, exceeding all in pleasures and delights. So truly do the blessings which I desire befall me, that whatever I undertake is brought about and constantly succeeds. So does one delight succeed other delights. Just now, Stasimus, the servant of Lesbonicus, came to me at home. He told me that his master, Carmides, has arrived here from abroad. Now he must be forthwith waited upon by me, that the father may prove a more sure foundation in that matter on which I have treated with his son. I'll go. But this door, with its creaking, inopportunely causes me delay. He retires to a distance. Scene 2. Enter Carmides and Callicles. There never was, nor will there be, nor yet do I think that there is a person upon the earth whose fidelity and constancy towards his friend equals yours. For without you, it would have been that he would have ousted me out of this house. If I have in any way acted well towards my friend, or have faithfully consulted his advantage, I seem not to be deserving of praise. But I think I am free from fault. For a benefit which is conferred on a man for his own, at once is lost to the giver. What is given only as a loan, the same there is a right to ask back whenever you please. Tis so as you say, but I cannot sufficiently wonder at this, that he has betrothed his sister into a family so influential. I, to Lysiteles, the son of Philto. Lysiteles behind. Why, he is mentioning my name. He has got into a most worthy family. Lysiteles behind. Why do I hesitate to address these persons? But still, I think I may wait a while, for something is going to be said to the purpose about this matter. Oh. What's the matter? I forgot just now to tell you of it indoors. As I was coming hither a while ago, a certain swindling fellow met me, a very finished sharper. He told me that he was carrying a thousand gold pieces of my giving to you and my son Labonicus, a fellow that I know not who he was, nor have I ever seen him anywhere before. But why do you laugh? He came by my directions, as though he was one bringing the gold from you to me, to give as a portion to your daughter, that your son, when I should give it to her from my own hands, might suppose that it had been brought from you, and that he might not anyhow be enabled to discover the fact itself that your treasure was in my possession, and demanded of me, as having belonged to his father by the public laws. Charmingly contrived, in troth. Megaronides, a, a common well-wisher of yours and mine, planned this. Well, I applaud his device, and approve of it. Lysiteles behind. Why, in my foolishness, while I fear to interrupt their discussion, am I standing here alone, and am not forwarding the business that I was intending to transact. I will accost these persons. He advances. Who is this person that is coming this way towards us? Lysiteles, going up to Carmides. Lysiteles salutes his father-in-law, Carmides. May the gods grant you, Lysiteles, whatever you may desire. Am I not worthy of a salutation? Yes, health to you, Callicles. It is right that I should give him the preference. The tunic is nearer the skin than the cloak. I trust that the gods may direct your plans all right. I hear that my daughter has been betrothed to you. Unless you are unwilling. Nay, I am not unwilling. Do you then promise your daughter for my wife? I promise a thousand gold Philippian pieces, as well, for a portion. I care nothing about a portion. If she pleases you... The portion which he presents to you must be pleased as well. In fine, the object which you desire you shall not have, unless you shall take that which you do not desire. Calaiscales to Lysiteles. He asks but justice. He shall obtain it, you the advocate and the judge, 
On these conditions, do you engage that your daughter shall be given to me as my wife? I do promise her. And I promise her likewise. Oh, save you, my connections by marriage. He embraces them. But in good sooth, there are some matters on account of which I still am angry with you. What have I done? Because you have allowed my son to become dissolute. Had that been done by my consent, there would have been cause for you to blame me. But allow me to obtain of you this one thing which I entreat. What is it? You shall know. If he has done anything imprudently, that you will dismiss it all from your mind. Why do you shake your head? My heart is tortured, and I fear. What is it now? Because he is such as I would that he is not. By that am I tortured. I fear that if I refuse you what you ask of me, you may suppose that I am indifferent towards you. I won't make difficulties, however. I will do as you wish. You are a worthy man. I'm going to call him out. He goes to the door of the house of Carmides. Tis a shocking thing if one is not allowed to punish bad deserts just as they merit. Lysiteles knocking at the door. Open the door. Open quickly, and call Lesbonicus out of doors if he is at home. The occasion is very sudden, therefore I wish him to come to me with all haste. Scene 3. Enter Lesbonicus from the house. What person has been calling me out of doors with so loud a knocking? Tis your well-wisher and friend. Is all quite right? Tell me. All's well. I am glad to say that your father has returned from abroad. Who says so? I. Have you seen him? I and you yourself may see him too. He points to Carmides. Oh, my father, my father, blessings on you. Many blessings on you, my son. If, father, any trouble... Have no fear, nothing has happened. My affairs prosperously managed, I have returned safe. If you are only wishful to be steady, that daughter of Callicles has been promised you. I will marry both her, father, and anyone else besides that you shall bid me. Although I have been angry with you, one misery, in fact, is more than enough for one man. Nay, rather, twere too little for him. For if he were to marry a hundred wives for his sins, it were too little. But henceforth, in future, I will be steady. So you say, if you will only do it. Is there any reason why I should not bring my wife home tomorrow? Very good. And you, Lysidolus, be ready to be married the day after tomorrow. A comedian. Give your applause. End of Act 5. End of Trinumus, the Three Pieces of Money by Titus Maxius Plotus. Translated by Henry Thomas Riley.